So, um, so uh, good afternoon and welcome to the virtual inauguration ceremony and first workshop on gender sensitization under the Gati project. So I would first like to um, invite Professor Kujiu Kulkarni, who is the president of the NC, to the Gati and address the audience. Professor Kulkarni. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Kavita, you were audio was not clearly it was not clear so you may want to look at it huh? yeah. okay so let's get started good afternoon to you all and uh, wish you a happy new year uh, this is a gati program as we all know our center jncsr is one among the 30 participating institutions uh, selected by dst in its uh, pilot project uh, named gati uh, to bring together gender equality in institutions through the GATI programs. So we are uh, signatory to the GATI charter, so to say. Through this, uh, one aspires to create an enabling environment for equal participation of women in science, technology, the, the STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, medicine, and mathematics at all levels, addressing uh, deep-rooted problems, we are all aware of them. Gati will pilot a sustainable self-assessment and accreditation model. And uh, the participating institutions would be expected to commit to adopting principles of gender equity within their policies and practices. This is something in the center we are very keenly looking forward to. So I'm very happy to be amidst you all while JNC is hosting the first, uh, its first uh, uh, gender sensitization workshop. And uh, on this occasion, I've been asked to inaugurate the uh, website linked to this activity, which is hosted on our server. Uh, so let's uh, uh, do that. Okay, here we go. I'm very happy to inaugurate the, the, the web portal related to the Gati program at JNCSI. And on this occasion, it's fine. On this occasion, I would like to share with you that uh, uh, we do have many women faculty members uh, uh, in the center uh, who carry out excellent research activities and also the shoulder very important uh, responsibilities uh, in the past and also now as the deans and chairs of units and responsible for various administrative matters and all that. So this is very heartening. And I take this opportunity to thank uh, the resource persons of the program, Professor Rohini Gorpele from IAC and uh, Dr. Patiba Jolie, who is the overall PI of the Gati programs and also consultant at NAC for agreeing to be with us during this formal launch. And I think they'll also be addressing us. And also a big thanks to Professor Kavita Jain for shouldering this responsibility and also organizing this uh, first uh, workshop. Uh, Ms. Nabunita Guha also, uh, she has been the project coordinator, thanks to her as well. And I'm sure uh, more such programs will be hosted under Gati at JNC, and we're all looking forward to the programs. Thank you, Kavita. Okay, thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Um, so um, you will now start the program. We have two talks today. So the first talk will be delivered by Dr. Pratiba Jolly. So I, can you share your slides, Pratiba? In the meanwhile, I'll introduce you. So Dr. Pratiba Jolly is leading, is leading development of the framework for the pilot program Gati, which was launched in 2020 by the DST. She has served as the principal of Miranda House, which is a women's college in University of Delhi until 2019. And under her leadership, the college received All India Rank 1 and the NIRF, a feat sustained for five years since 2017. Dr. Jolly was chair of IUPAC, Commission on Physics Education and Vice President of IUPAC, 
and for her long and distinguished service to physics education with international impact, she uh, was awarded an IUP, IUPAP medal in 2019. Dr. Jolly received her PhD in chemical physics from University of Delhi in 1980, and she is a fellow of NASI and Institute of Physics UK. And currently she is with NAC as academic consultant. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Pratima, especially since you know I am also an alumna of Miranda House. So I'm looking forward to your talk. You have 20 minutes for the talk and five minutes for a question and answer, and I'll alert you at 17 minutes. Over to you. It was for, uh, uh, thank you very much, Kavita, and thank you, Professor Kulkarni. It's such a pleasure to be here at uh, JNC today, and uh, congratulations for being one of the pilot institutions. We are really looking forward to uh, success of this program and many best practices emerging from one of the top institutions of the country, and especially where uh, women have uh, contributed tremendously to your many firsts, especially in research publications and output. So Gati is, um, the strategic intent is, as you have said correctly, to nudge institutions for, uh, towards supporting diversity inclusion and the full spectrum of talent for success and progression of all. And uh, as the name says, gender advancement for transforming institutions is the focus. So this uh, is a big shift in focus. There have been for several decades, many uh, schemes for women starting from scholarships to research grants and uh, facilitating mobility or career breaks and uh, also you know women technology parks alternate careers and so on and the very successful began jyoti which aims to catch uh, uh, young uh, women students uh, very young uh, but uh, gati is uh, transformative it is uh, looking now at institution as a whole because despite several schemes not much has moved as uh, proverbially the needle has not moved much and institutions it is felt should take charge of uh, uh, their own transformation uh, for excellence uh, involving uh, uh, female uh, community members in a very equitable way. And as self uh, learning organizations, I think this is the right approach. So there is a little nudge that is expected to go really far and uh, uh, be a game changer. Uh, with Gati, we now join the International Gen Gender Equality Charters, uh, the very successful Athena Swan in UK that's been operative for more than 15 years and has been adapted and adopted in other countries as SAGE in Australia, as Sea Change in USA. The USA from far earlier had very successful other programs such as ADVANCE and um, as Dimensions in Canada, which is just about taking off. So we hope that we'll be uh, uh, very uh, proactive partners uh, with all these international charters. And uh, just to set the uh, stage, uh, what is our agency? What is our role in this? Uh, we've, been, we've been invited by DST Kiran uh, Division uh, to develop the framework for Gati, and that uh, is in your hands now, and uh, you're already working on it as a Gati Charter Institution. And through British Council and then Advanced HE in UK, six Athena Swan institutions have been selected and six groups formed uh, with uh, uh, five Indian uh, pilot institutions uh, joining each of the SWAN cr uh, credited institutions. So um, uh, with, uh, not just with Queen Mary's at University of London, we do hope that uh, JNC uh, will uh, have a very vibrant interaction with its peers in India and uh, that they will be sharing of resources and uh, the UK India partnership will, I think, take off in a very big way in about a fortnight, and there will be a very structured interaction over eight phases. But that said, uh, while there is an inspiration from other international charters, Gati is deeply rooted in our own uh, higher education and research ecosystem, and we have to chart new territory, we have to create new practices that will work and will be anchored in our own institutions and our own understanding. So I would like to say a little bit about how uh, uh, institutions have been selected for participating in GATI. We floated an expression of interest application uh, in um, December of, um, um, uh, you know, almost a year back. And um, 
It was to see how institutions will engage with data and how reflectively would they be able to look at their own policies and so on. And uh, uh, Gati did catch the imagination of many institutions. We had close to 150 applications of which 30 have been selected. And uh, this provides a baseline on which we have been able to uh, develop the Gati framework. Uh, and that baseline, uh, in a way, confirms the hypothesis that we have a long way to go for gender equity. So I share with you some of the data from other research institutions who had applied for this. And it's interesting to look at this uh, uh, particular uh, ball. You know, you just look at the number of faculty and it ranges from something like 10% to just about 20% for most institutions. Why the population of undergraduate and postgraduate students is uh, far more. And um, uh, it's interesting to look at uh, something like a research cohort composed of the PhD, postdoc, and research associates and the female faculty. And that number, the red ball, is significantly higher. So this does represent, in a sense, the talent pool of women uh, going upwards. This is confirmed in all kinds of surveys and data that is available. And if we were to look at the gender profile of across the pipeline for uh, JNC, uh, we do see that you have a very strong research cohort. And of course, your score is 100 on 100 in the latest NRF on research publications, but the gender score uh, uh, does uh, uh, fall short. And that is because the number of faculty is not in proportion to the kind of um, expectation. It is uh, about 15% plus minus one because the data across different sources tends to vary. So there is much that we need to do. And uh, with uh, females outperforming often um, in undergraduate, postgraduate uh, courses and at PhD level, even outnumbering in many, many disciplines, Female talent is knocking on the doors of elite institutions, you know, looking for niche jobs in institutions such as yours. But uh, across the board, be it the IITs, be it institutes of national importance or some of our top ranked research institutions, the numbers have the same story to say. And uh, essentially the numbers tend to say in IITs range from eight to 13%. And uh, this needs a very drastic overhaul. And um, so, uh, as I said, just for interest, you would see that the latest uh, All India State of Higher Education confirms this also for higher education institutions, the university, and so on. In engineering and technology, we are still somewhere close to about 30%, while in basic sciences, and if you look in detail at uh, the basic sciences, say physics, chemistry, uh, mathematics, we tend to be doing rather well at PhD level. So where are the women going after they attain this high uh, professional uh, degrees? So this is something that we want to be looking at very seriously. We know that Nobel Prizes this year, we, there was a blank on the sciences, and so too in Shanti Suru Bhatnagar Prizes. So hardly 3.7% women are being awarded. Of course, they are pockets of excellence. And talent is in abundance, even though the numbers are very, very small. But this is not proportionate to what is the expectation. And we have a long journey ahead of us. And uh, this is exactly what the uh, World Economic Forum reports also tell us that, um, in fact, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the popu uh, population of women who are in employment tends to be decreasing in India. It's uh, gone down as much as about 7% uh, in the last, uh, uh, from 1990 to 2019. And in pandemic, of course, uh, there's another cat catastrophe. Women also um, do far more of unpaid caregiving work than men. And, uh, the gender parity is really elusive at the moment. While educational attainment is around the corner, um, the quality of it is something that needs to be debated because the because of economic, socio-political reasons, it it is predicted that it may take hundred years to bridge the overall gender gap, or as much as about two fifty years for the economic gender gap. So there is an urgent need on many global initiatives across the board 
and uh, for women in science in particular, we do need to do much more. We cannot ignore the potential of women, as I have just demonstrated, look at their professional attainments, look at their aspirations. So we need also to understand that if we are to, um, you know, sort of uh, ascend further in terms of economies or in, in terms of our uh, um, science and technology leveraging for economic growth and economic em empowerment, we need to uh, leverage the potential of women and do it in a very systematic and structured way. And this is going to be the challenge of the day. So equity, diversity and inclusion, these are the most important uh, terms these days, and we need to look at what we should be uh, working on. So equity in the sense of uh, uh, making the uh, uh, playing field level for the entire workforce, including women, diversity, talking about participation of underrepresented groups, including women, and inclusion, which is really creating a sense of belonging and value, not just giving jobs, but creating a um, um, you know, sense of belonging and participation at the highest echelons and at, at, in every facet of uh, societal and uh, institutional life. So gender here poses a very special challenge. As I've just demonstrated through data, the career progression and advancement along the academic pipeline does show attenuation uh, in a very major way. And um, this has been uh, explored in many ways. And uh, as women progress from uh, initial uh, positions, uh, a move towards leadership and decision-making uh, uh, roles, uh, or uh, look for awards, they experience many, many impediments, barriers, and challenges. This could be lack of mentoring uh, in the earlier stages as early career researchers, or implicit and explicit bias uh, right at recruitment or in appraisal and further selection for certain challenging roles. And uh, there is therefore a sense of lack of inclusion, sense of lack of belonging that begins to grow as women progress. And uh, this needs to be addressed and uh, Gati hopes to do that. So institutions today need to develop diversity intelligence. The quality of the institution is going to depend on its willingness, its capacity to create opportunities and valuable experiences for growth of all. A lot of handholding is needed just for about just anyone as they begin a career uh, which is very challenging. And uh, this has been globally asserted. Uh, I'm not really going to read through all because of the shortage of time, but SDG 5 uh, talks about equality for women, but it is critical and underpins attainment of all SDGs and India is committed to it. We also committed to upholding international laws and policies, missions and goals, uh, which speak of equality of uh, equality in a very big way, um, the universal declaration of human rights and elimination of all forms of discrimination, especially against women. And um, taking that forward in India, we ourselves have uh, uh, very strong rules and uh, um, uh, statutory requirements. We also have national laws and policies that speak about right to equality and uh, right uh, against discrimination. In particular, there is a statutory mandate for prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace. And uh, all institutions do have, uh, have shown compliance with the formation of internal complaint committee. And um, we also have uh, many uh, uh, other benefits. And uh, we were surprised when we asked in the UI for gender policies, uh, most institutions actually forgot to write about the very many benefits, the fa family benefits that are certainly a part of policy and uh, uh, other, um, uh, you know, uh, empowering uh, statutory requirements in institutions. So based on these understandings, Gati, has at its heart, in, uh, at the core, a set of 10 principles, the key principles, and I'm so glad that you have today put them up on your website and inaugurated that. 
and uh, not just that the uh, leadership of Betty Pilot institutions are signatories. It would be wonderful if each one of the community members becomes a signatory to the Gati principles, the charter which explicitly articulates uh, uh, the uh, uh, the situation that I have uh, right now narrated that is important to uphold diversity and that women do experience uh, uh, some form of bias and uh, underrepresentation and loss and that it would be very important for us to uh, look at the policies for transformative changes for benefit of all male and female community members but also important to look at today gender not through the binary but the full spectrum uh, and the intersectionality with other issues. So the Gati model is a self-assessment and accreditation model that will collect evidence and data, critically analyze, examine policies, and, and ideate to develop smart action plans. As we move on, I'm going to elaborate a, a, a bit more on this. We have created to this, uh, for, to this end a gender equity indicator framework which is criteria based and it would obviously look at the gender profile of the institution in terms of data and so on. But much more importantly, it would look at every stage of uh, advancement uh, along the uh, academic pipeline and the policies, processes, procedures and practices, both formal and informal. I'm going to dwell a lot on what is the gender climate and organizational culture. So going beyond data, we do want to look at the complete ecosystem, the day-to-day -day functioning in which uh, 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 very often um, uh, there is a sense that we do not have a level playing field or that uh, uh, stereotypical thinking still prevails even in the best of institutions. But we have much to showcase in all institutions. So we do want to highlight uh, some institutional values, best practices and case studies for others to emulate. And building on this, we want to see how the Gatti Charter principles can be strategically integrated in every facet of the institutional life. So this is the 18 month charter journey that began in August of 2021 and will go on uh, till January 2023 with applications due sometime in October end of this year 2022. We already are here where um, um, uh, you know there's a commitment to integrating the principles, the framework is in your hands and the Gati self-assessment team uh, is uh, uh, functional. Uh, the first set of actions has been taken uh, and I'm really glad that a, a, a website is launched today and some orientation work has begun. And so this is going to be an arduous journey of collecting evidence by data. I also do include qualitative evidence and uh, reflect on uh, uh, what we are finding and on the basis of that create specific and relevant actions and uh, with that done, it should be easy to put the application together for peer review and the team recognition. So this assessment and application goes beyond data. It is about connecting the dots. So GIAF is providing the structure, but it's a great opportunity to review policies, every facet of the institutional functioning and focus on uh, understanding, interpreting um, what we are unraveling through either numbers or much more importantly through uh, qualitative um, anecdotes and uh, uh, conversations um, and you know under, uh, understanding uh, where uh, we uh, we can do better and how we can sustain change that we plan to do and um, it's here that the gender climate becomes very important. So like anything that we undertake, any scientific problem, there is a vocabulary to be understood in a very nuanced and in a very particular way. By gender climate, we understand the perceptions, the attitudes, the expectations of the community, the, and how do they develop in interaction between students, staff, faculty, leadership, and so on. And we want to reflect on policies, processes, practices, plans and 
how these are perceived by the community. One day, the same thing can be perceived as just perfect. And later in the evening, you know, if your work doesn't get done or you encounter an impediment, then you do think that, you know, the world is collapsing and nothing seems to be working in the institution. So day-to-day -day functioning can be impacted by uh, an individual's perspective and uh, hierarchical structures. And these can vary. These are all dynamic factors and they vary from moment to moment very often. And uh, resource allocation, professional and social interaction, everything impacts climate. So how do experiences and perceptions impact the contribution and advancement of individuals, both male and female, across the spectrum is something that we want to look at. It so happens that we have identified that uh, there is a gender inequity, but this is a larger problem and it does impact every member of the community. By organizing the culture, yeah. Give me your three minutes. Yeah, I'm really running short. Okay, so by organizational culture, uh, we uh, really want to be looking at uh, uh, some problem in the. Uh, yeah, uh, we're looking at the values that individuals bring to the uh, institution. And these would be deeply held ideas, deeply rooted assumptions. And a lot of effort is required by each one of us, male and female, to alter beliefs and value systems uh, with which we have grown up. And appropriate sensitization programs are very, very important and interventions are very important. So whatever may be our individual values, it is extremely important that we create an institutional culture that reflects the goals of higher education. And we all have to come on board and be willing to set aside personal uh, interpretations and personally held beliefs so that we all are on the same page as far as our uh, functioning in the institution is concerned. And this can bring transformative change in the uh, beliefs we hold. And uh, that is where the community becomes extremely important. So uh, the, the way this application is going to be looked at, we have created a set of gender uh, indicators and peer review criteria. It follows the action research methodology. Um, you look at a focal uh, uh, problem area, collect data, observe, analyze, reflect on it and act and uh, refine the process. And this is a very, very um, iterative process. Uh, the work will always be one in progress. And uh, you may have the best policies, but one has to remain open that uh, community work is always a work in progress and it's always a very challenging act. So the application is going to have for the set of criteria and the sub criteria uh, a structure where for each dimension one has to review uh, uh, their guidance for that, uh, look at evidence and create action plans. And uh, institutions need to leverage existing data because uh, India has uh, moved today uh, in, uh, for sharing data, whether it be ASHA um, um, or NRF or uh, our reporting to uh, funding agencies and so on. So uh, much already exists and we are moving as one nation, one data regime. Uh, so we also, much more importantly, need to understand community perceptions uh, through surveys and audits, structured feedback, open feedback, discussions and debates. Uh, very, very important to uh, give uh, uh, due uh, um, uh, emphasis on what we hear formally and informally, the anecdotes, the stories, the narratives, all this, the dots will get connected to give us the large picture and therefore a credible community engagement is at the heart of Gati, not the numbers, not the quantity that I uh, graphed earlier, because this is where innovation will come in. This is where a sense of openness to what we are doing will come in. So we have to evolve tools for transformation, not be gender blind, because that would reinforce stereotypes and gender inequalities. Females and males have uh, different obligations. We need uh, to, of course, be gender aware and address uh, and accommodate sometimes. You know, we have more or less been in our institutions gender aware, accommodating and working around gender differences. But now we need to move towards gender responsiveness, which is to overcome stereotypes, barriers and challenges and stimulate transformative change in systems, structures and norms and do it on the continuum, understanding that they 
policies, practices, and anything that happens, there's a lot of uh, intersection and uh, dots are entangled. And we have to work in this entangled environment uh, in a gender responsive way to work towards um, gender equity because it's about human beings. And it is not just an employee or a worker, it is a whole a person and a holistic understanding of the workplace requires a holistic understanding of lives of people who play uh, um, in that. And so uh, 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 work-life dynamics uh, is very, very important in this. And I'm glad that at this workshop, we are giving visibility to Betty and its charger. We have begun the first engage set of engagements with the community. But we need to build a community of practice, create a growing circle of allies and stakeholders and men colleagues included in a very, very big way as our best advocates. And so thank you, Professor Kulkarni, for sitting through this session and um, leading Gati, so to say. So in this self-assessment process, building a community of practice and this being used as a technical term is very, very important. We have to, for anything we do, it could be a task, it could be a focus area, it could be a problem, develop a community understanding and convert it into a practice. And that is where the dynamics of change will come and institutional transformation and personal growth will take place. So I spoke about shared values and shared beliefs and attitudes. So that is going to be the most important thing as far as gender equity is concerned to the last person. We have to develop these shared goals and practices. We have to evolve a common vocabulary, and I hope Gati will change the vocabulary in a very major way and uh, change social cultural practices. So in this then, as we move forward as a set of pilot institution, we hope that you share resources and experiences and best practices because we would uh, we hope that we will scale it up in a mission mode to the rest of the country at the end of the Gati Charter journey by the pilots. So um, I'm not for a shortage of time going to go through all the criteria, which I had uh, thought I may get a chance to speak a little more on that. But I hope that we'll have an extended workshop one of these days and talk about that. So let me just uh, therefore say that um, since we spoke about uh, the uh, uh, academic pipeline, we hope that uh, to begin with, uh, we will look at the academic life cycle and what kind of transformative initiatives can take place. But um, um, uh, uh, while the numbers need to increase, uh, one does not think that, uh, you know, in about uh, the coming uh, eight months or nine months, we will make any drastic change. But what can certainly happen is that we can identify where the lacunae have been and where we have been, uh, let us say, if it is recruitment, you know, how we can move towards fair and transparent and uh, search or gender balance panels and what would be obvious by training and uh, how can we help uh, our faculty with better induction and resource allocation and um, how can we nudge and even though female uh, faculty often are hesitant at some points of uh, their personal lives to assume leadership, uh, how this hesitancy or barriers can be removed. And so organizational culture will go a long, long way in impacting work-life policies, most important, foremost being dignity at work. And uh, we hope and we are creating some of these resource materials that we will be able to work with the pilot institutions uh, in uh, developing uh, many of these changes which are going to be uh, um, a little tough. So I, I'm going to, uh, for a shortage of time, uh, I'll just stop here, um, uh, highlighting a couple of uh, criteria which I think are very, very important. One, gender policies, processes, and um, talking of work-life dynamics. So it's not yeah, I'm, I'll take one minute more. And dignity at work okay. and resource yeah. allocations. So this is something that we want to be looking at. And uh, we want to look at uh, uh, the canvas that is available to us for mentoring. As in liberal um, uh, educational environments, this canvas is huge. It takes place through seminars, conferences, community engagements, alumni engagements, societies, clubs, the whole range of extramural work. 
And this needs to be leveraged as uh, we move forward from that deal. And uh, we hope that uh, at the end of it, uh, institutions will create uh, uh, a strategic vision and prioritize short-term action plans, three of them that can be implemented uh, 18 months after the Gati Charter uh, uh, journey formally is accomplished, and two of them that can be accomplished in something like eight, uh, three years. And that these action plans will lead to sustenance of what are the learnings from Gati and uh, how these have been integrated and assimilated in every facet of institutional life. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope that as we go along, we will develop a shared vocabulary and change mindset and uh, uphold all statutory obligations, create new gender policy frameworks and uh, have a gender vision and agency through our action plans. So within this, JNC is one of the most important critical actors. Thanks a lot, and sorry for exceeding a little. And uh, thanks a lot to my bright young team. Uh, they're here attending. So we'll take it from there. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks a lot, Pratiba, for our informative talk. And I think we're just slightly behind schedule. So we will uh, see if there are any questions. People should just write it in the chat box and I'll forward it to Pratiba and we'll uh, see it later. So um, I'll now move to the second talk uh, by Professor Rohini Godbole. Hi, Rohini. Can you share your screen, please? So Hello. Hello. Yeah, I will just share the screen in half a second. Yeah. I am a bit, I get very confused about sharing a screen in WebEx. Yeah, I think it's okay, no? Yeah. Is it full uh, view? Full screen? It's not full screen yet. Yeah. Okay. Looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let Jeez. me introduce you. Uh, so Professor Rohini M. Godbol is currently an honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science. She is a very well-known, internationally renowned theoretical particle physicist. Um, her pioneering work on probing hadronic interactions of photons at colliders has provided important insights for the designs of electron positron colliders. And in fact, her ideas have been used in experiments at different colliders. She is an elected fellow of all three science academies of India, as well as to us. Uh, she has been the vice president of INSA, and she is and also has been on editorial boards of various national and international journals, various international scientific advisory boards uh, bodies. She is also the recipient of the fourth highest civilian honor of the government of India, namely the Padma Shri. Uh, recently, uh, the honor order of national merit was conferred upon her by the French government and a DSC by IIT Kanpur. Uh, Rohini is an avid supporter of women in science, and that was one reason we wanted to have her here. And many of she has done a lot of work, and uh, one of the things I will mention is the book that she has edited called Lilavati's Daughters, which many of you are familiar with. She has also chaired a committee which drafted discussions on equity and inclusion in India's science, technology, and innovation policy of 2020. So it's really nice to have you here, uh, Rohini. You're one of the first female physicists I knew, and you have always been inspiring. So it's really glad to uh, have you here. So you have 20 minutes for your talk and uh, five minutes for question and answers. So I alert you at 70 minutes. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Kavita, for this very kind introduction. So, Professor Kulkarni, Professor uh, Jolly, of course, Professor Jain, and all the rest who are uh, on the WebEx link. It's a pleasure to be talking about this. In fact, uh, when Tatiba was talking, I kind of felt it would have been perhaps better that I spoke first because I am not going to go into the nitty gritties of Gati, which is today's uh, discussion, but more in some sense, uh, how and why all of us thought about having a program like Gati. So this is more, uh, but now I think I will slightly change the way I speak because she has done such a great job of laying the stage. So I will skip some of my early slides, in fact. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to talk about uh, something slightly different as to why the gender diversity in science is important for science also. 
I mean, this is one aspect that we seem to need to keep in focus, I feel. Uh, of course, uh, as was told by Pratibha, both policy changes as well as changes in the mindset are going to be necessary to bring about a gender equity and make a, a science ecosystem diverse. And then I would like to very briefly touch upon the considerations of equity and inclusion in the STIP 2020. And as I see, Girgati is really an instrument that has now been set up by the DST to move towards gender equity. But I feel that the efficacy of this whole exercise will be finally limited by the vision of the scientists and the institutions, that is us. And therefore, we have to have, again, as emphasized by Pratibha, we have to have discussions within to see where we want to go and what steps we need to take. And my talk is more or less suggestions of some steps I would try to sort of to summarize a few of the ideas that uh, I have personally I have developed over the years. You know, one of the motivations of equity and inclusion in science is really to correct historical injustices and correct for the exclusion of, let's say, women from the processes of science. But as I said, it is equally important and that will change the way we handle the subject and the way we put in our efforts. So it is equally important for us to realize that this inclusion and diversity can only aid in increasing the efficacy of the scientific processes because it would add more and more dimensions to the inquiries that we make scientifically and therefore to have excellence in SIT. So for me, achieving diversity means inclu inclusion of those groups which were excluded traditionally and equity for those underrepresented groups which have some amount of inclusion, and that I would say is gender. By inclusion, we are ending just numbers. So clearly, one thing was said again and again, and is said by everybody that clearly lack of gender diversity is really not the optimal use of humanity's intellectual potential. So we want to, we must look at achieving equity it's not only as an activity for women and by women. So, Professor Kurni, I would like actually to say, I just quickly looked at the participants in this meeting and there are very few men. I mean, this is my first message. If this institute wants to make transformative initiatives, one has to convince the, and one has to, the entire institute has to participate. This is not for women and by women program. So this is my first uh, lesson and statement actually. You know, people have asked why discuss diversity and SNT together? I mean, SNT is, you know, objective. Where does the diversity come into picture? And I want, you know, another way of asking the same thing. Do you really, can you really prove that diversity adds to excellence of science? And I would like to answer by quoting from an open letter to the Supreme Court Justice of US that was written by professional physicists and it was signed by about 2000 physicists in the US in 2015 in answer to a question that was asked by the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, which was uh, what unique perspective does a minority student bring to a physics class? Now he was talking about racial diversity, but you can replace the word minority by, you know, gender, consider gender as a minority, though he was talking about racial minority. And the answer is that science relies heavily on consensus about acceptable results, as well as future research directions, where the diversity among scientists becomes a crucial aspect for an objective bias free development of science. And all the participants bring their background, their ways of thinking, methods of applying physics to real world problems and the potential to educate others through their unique perspectives. So this is something that we must realize that the gender equity has to be obtained because physics and the science is the gainer at the end of the day. Now, clearly, you know, it is silly to say that lack of, lack of equity has impeded development of excellent science. I mean, science as we know it beginning from, okay, for me physics, so beginning from Newton, you know, last few hundred, uh, hundreds of years, it has been dominated by white Caucasian males and it, they have been excellent progress. So why am I still say, saying this? So I want to point out something, some place 
where lack of opportunities actually caused science to lose something. That is the lack of, that is the uh, achieving gender equity could perhaps avoid these losses. And one example I would want to take is Sophie Jama. There are also clearly clear examples in the history where the gender diversity, having gender diversity in workforce actually was responsible for a gain. And this is the story of the invis hidden figures of, you know, the time which is described in the book called Hidden Figures, which was the contribution of African American women of deep south in 1900, you know, around the Second World War, time when even the social, you know, uh, integration in the deep south hadn't happened. And at that time, it is this African American women of deep south which contributed to the US space program in a dominant way. The first program uh, uh, head of this uh, computing center of NASA was a woman. And today, the US society bemoans the lack of participation of uh, women in computing and uh, uh, mathematics. So somewhere along the line, we lost it, they lost it. So here I'm trying to sort of tell you that lack of diversity can actually be loss of science and gain of diversity can actually lead to gain in science. We have examples of both here. I will uh, not really discuss Sophie Germa's example very much, but all I want to tell you is that you can see from the years, she lived a few years, she was born a few years before the French Revolution, and she lived rather young, uh, she died rather young, and she was not able to get formal training in mathematics because of the social uh, prejudices. She actually, in spite of everything, did contribute, made very important contributions to mathematics. She devised something called Jarma numbers, and in fact, some of her work has had, had implications for the final solution of Fermat's last theorem. But in, most of the time, if you go through her work and her life, you will realize that the quality of her work could have you know, suffered due to lack of formal training. The example being that she won an essay award for a essay on theory of elasticity. It had to go back to her three times by the, so to say, the examiners, because this, the proofs were not rigorous, and the proofs were not rigorous because she hadn't received any formal training. So here I'm giving you an example how lack of equity could have led, might have led to some lack of science. Of course, as I said, science is objective and is universal. New content of Newton's law would have been the same, even if it was invented by a woman or a black or a Hindu or whatever you want to call it. So why is diversity then so important? Because the issues in science you choose to investigate, processes that you put in place can actually be influenced by cultural, racial, and gender background. Shalini Arya of ICT in Bombay is one, and her work is an example of that. Another much more technical example is about the role of diversity in science. This was a paper that appeared in Animal Behavior in 2020, not too far back. And there, what they saw is that women were making greater contribution to the emerging work field of female bird song. Till a few decades ago, people used to think that only male birds have a courtship songs. And now it has emerged that females also have courtship songs. And I know not tell you how the very fact that females have a courtship song can affect you know, our theories about even evolution, how things develop. In ecological sciences, this is an important concept. And this research got that has now taken up sort of off in the past few decades is almost completely dominated by women scientists. So this tells us who we are, some affects sometimes what work we do. So on the whole, a diversity is intrinsically good for science and it makes good pragmatic and economic sense. The science and technology is a system ecosystem is the beneficiary. And therefore, this is to be not looked upon as charity to the underrepresented group, that is the women, to give, you know, their, that their creative abilities get expression. This is something that we all need to remember when we implement Gati project or we implement any processes, is that this is something we are doing for all of us. And I think this, you know, understanding or in in internalizing this can actually affect the way we 
look at it. So now I come to the, the sort of se se second, somewhat shorter part of my talk, that how to achieve diversity and how to measure it. You know, it's easy to see there is a lack of diversity and equity in science. You know, Pratibha has given you numbers and we, can, we all know those numbers. Important thing is to ask how to cure things and even more importantly, how to judge what level of diversity and equity is correct. Is there such a thing as correct level? We'll be happy if we have 50, 50%. If I say 10% is low, what is right? So lack of numerical representation is a symptom. We must correct it. We must set some numerical targets, but that does not mean problems are over. Achieving numerical targets is necessary, but it's not sufficient, and we need to address the reasons of the problems. And as I said, this is the second part where I wanted to talk about uh, what we need to do and what are really the reasons because my own view is that one of the important step in the process of you know, trying to cure this is really to become aware of some not so obvious issues at the level of scientists who are participating in the process of science and at the level of uh, at science administrators and institutions. So I'm giving you a sort of a quick uh, graphical representation of the numbers that were given by that in India, Indian story, the real fall off comes here after PhD. In the rest of the world, actually, there is not such a big fraction of PhDs, uh, of women in, among PhDs. And uh, she has given you even more uh, stratified uh, data. But the point here is that in India, real fall comes after PhD. So in the, and this is sort of how do we compare with the rest of the world? This is the UNESCO data. And you can see the colors and you realize that the world average is 30% for women in science, in research, whereas India is between zero to 30%, it's actually 15%. So we are way below the world average. So the Indian problem, this is about women in research. So from 35 to 40% of women in edu higher education, 30% women in PhDs, we come down women in research to about 10 to 15 percent level. So the development of human resource is important, but the deployment of human resource is very important for Indian women. And that is where the institutions and the practicing scientists have a big role to play. So apart from my telling you the advantages that a diverse workforce gets, I also see that pragmatically this drop off of women is a problem of low return on investment. The money that has been spent in training these women to do their PhD is basically gone down the drain. So we really cannot afford this loss of trained scientific human power. And but then you would kind of and kind of this is a question that people outside science will ask often: is that how is it any different than women in any other parts of uh, profession? How is how the life in science is different from? any other uh, professional group. And I think for women in science, there is a specific problem, and that I like to call the ticking clocks. The body clocks and the professional clocks are ticking exactly at the same time. In all the other professions, if you're a medical doctor, if you're an engineer, whatever have you, if you're a lawyer, there is no gestation period between the degree you get and the professional life you begin. But in a scientist's life, the postdoctoral period right after your PhD is the most important to make your own niche, make your own influence felt. And this is also the time when the body clock is ticking. If I want to have a family, this is the best time for my life from the body of my point of view. So this ticking clocks is a problem that is specific to uh, science. And that is, again, I want to give you examples how specifically institutions and uh, policies can uh, uh, handle that. There are, of course, other problems which are common also in all the other spheres also, also the other professional women, and that the famous family and career balance, and that is, you know, that is faced by women in not just in science careers, in all careers. So the general feeling is that these are the obvious and visible causes. If we take care of it, that will be enough. And let us just look at what institutions need to do to handle these two problems, and that would be the end of it. So the perception is solve these problems and all will be well. 
In fact, policies exist. Uh, again, uh, Pratibha has mentioned this. Policies exist to come back to a career after break. Policies exist for flexi time. Policies exist to encourage young girls to choose science and technology. There are training programs, handholding programs for young women scientists. They are all there. But the reality is that it is necessary, but not sufficient. And I think this is something women themselves also need to realize what, when we ask, what is it that we are asking for? What is it that we are looking for? And that has to do with how to deal with invisible and unconscious biases. Biases about what women can do and cannot do, about what women should do and should not do. And that affects the mentoring that we give to young women. And this is all of us, the scientists, who give this mentoring. And this impacts the decisions that the young men and women take. And of course, that impacts the number of women that stay in SNT and what they can achieve. And I believe, and this is the, my sort of general understanding after all these years, that all much of it arises from the lack of importance that we attach to a woman's participation in the science, in research, in the eyes of society, as well as scientists. And a proper understanding of this issue can actually lead the institutions and scientists to plan how we should overcome this bias. I think to me, that is really the uh, thing in India that we need to begin to think about. What que questions can you ask in interviews? Please. Yes, madam. We have I will minutes. have about five more slides. I have five more slides. So what que questions can we ask in interviews? Whether we are using unequal criteria while discussing men and women, when we are hiring them. The scientists and administrators need to ask hard questions about this. And institutions need to develop guidelines on this. And we have to make people aware, the scientists who are involved and the administrators, aware of these biases. You know, just to give a few examples, if you want to discuss a two-body problem and the problem of mobility, it should be not while you are hiring. This question and the discussion should come after a decision about hiring has been taken. But normally, for a woman, even today, even in my own institution, this is one of the questions that get asked in the interview. And I think that's completely inappropriate. You don't do this to a man. Or judging independence in research, we are very quick quite often for thinking that a woman is not independent if she has collaborators. And if she doesn't have collaborators, then she can't get along with anybody. I have seen this more than once while sitting on the committees. And these are things that we need to ask ourselves. Are we saying this because this is our true judgment? Or is, are we saying it because we are biased? You know, also taking into account possible career breaks or slowing down due to physiological reasons. Can we think of having academic age versus biological age? These are the things that at an institutional level, institutes can think about re, you know, revamping some of the mechanisms. And the elephant in the room, harassment. A very good handling of this issue requires maturity on both sides. A girl who comes to an institution far away from home at a somewhat young age needs to feel safe, needs to feel happy, needs to feel included. Of course, sexual harassment comes under the purview of ICC and which is a recurring legal requirement. We all have it. But the discussions and actions have to go beyond this legal requirement. Realizing that harassment need not be always explicitly sexual. We haven't had discussions of these. And these discussions require a lot of dialogue. Mm -hmm. This requires, you know, understanding the gender harassment for students and postdocs by having this dialogue that, to some extent, what Pratibha was talking about. And this dialogue, I think, is something that we need to set. We need to involve ourselves in. Then we need to avoid insensitivity to dental dependencies of certain needs. After hiring, institutions need to see whether some of the needs might have a gender dependency. You know, one thing, for example, adaptive tenure policies, do we have them? Can institutes evaluate and implement progressive tenure and promotion policies? I would say, yes, IISC has recently introduced a very good tenure policy, but discussions of this and decide to come arise through a consultative process or accommodation on campus. My own experience 40 years ago was that one of the, you know, in India, in many cities, accommodation on campus is something very, which provides safety to a woman. 
to a girl student, to a woman faculty. Or for example, one of the things that is not even being discussed yet is that when a student or a postdoc in the last year of a postdoc has, a, has to take maternity leave, can we think of extending that person's temporary uh, assignment by one more year through institutional support? We don't have that idea. Or child care can be an issue for students and PDFs. All these things we really need to think of thinking. For example, does the speaker list in a conference request reflect equity in the field? Not just gender, but all in institutional representation, for example. That if you have a conference at a con uh, all your colleagues, male, female, when we are holding a conference, looking at it attentively, it does my list of uh, speakers reflect equitably the participants in the subject in the country. Or when you make committees, and it should not be that there is 30% gender representation or 30% uh, representation. But I feel that one needs to look at proactively and try to make representation in committees, in, for example, even in student council, as equitable as you can. Of course, only after all academic considerations are the only ones that are going to direct the decision process. And if after a direct academic considerations, you think that you cannot have gender equity in your committees, gender equity in your speaker list, so be it, but I would find it very hard. So these are the kind of things which I feel the institutions can already begin to think that if we are holding a conference, can we make sure that the speaker presentation is uh, equitable? If we have a student council, is our student council representation equitable? You know, these are small things, but they go a long, long way. I had some examples of invisible bias, which I will not uh, talk to you about uh, because I am now running out of time. But I would like to, for example, ask the institution like yours, for example, and evaluate your own, uh, ex uh, own performance in treating women who are trying to come back to science, they're making use of the various DST schemes. In the these schemes have been around for 20 years. How, for example, your institution has it been welcoming to such care people? What is your attitude towards helping women to come back to uh, things? These are the kind of questions that I think institutions need to start asking. And imp while implementing the various policies that the government gives. One needs to realize that women scientists, there exist women scientists who care about science as much as they care about their family. And therefore, they might sub actually prefer support structures which allow them to go over this speed breaker than to take a uh, break from science. And that is why institutions helping, supporting women to in the early stages of the career, holding their hands. This might be something where that uh, institutions need to think about what kind of processes they could put in place, uh, for example. So I think I will, uh, I have uh, more examples of uh, what's happening, but my final message is that we need to introspect and autocorrect for invisible bias. And the most important thing there is the awareness raising. And to my mind, one of the, uh, because this uh, STIP 2020 had in fact uh, suggested for women that uh, particularly for women, but generally they wanted to develop an equity and inclusion charter, which will be specific to India and Gati charter is actually the example or part of that in the context of women. And I believe that now that the Gati charter has actually been set up and institutions like yours have actually accepted this as a charter, I think the next step for the institutions, for the scientists, is to have a dialogue within the institutions and think about processes that you would want to put in place, which may not achieve, you know, numbers are not the whole story, but it's more the atmosphere, the environment, the qualitative uh, issues. And that is where the consultation within the institutions is extremely important and participation by men in the institution is equally important. Otherwise, this process is doomed from the beginning if we don't realize that this is for all of us and by all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rainy, for inspiring talk.
Uh, I see there's a question for both of you. So if you can just very quickly address it. We just stop um, sharing one moment. Uh, yeah, so I think Shobna has a question, which is, uh, she's asking, um, so Shobna Narasimhan has a question, that how do we motivate or incentivize, incentivize institutions to change? So if you have a quick... Uh, uh, so if I may, if I have yeah, followed it up with know. the comment that most men didn't even attend today's session. So if they don't even attend a one hour long session, how do you motivate them to actually change their behavior? I'm hoping, Shobhana, that somewhere if the ranking, of, which is what is partly, partly the game in Gati, that somewhere if it gets linked to the that it one realizes that it is the prestige of the institute is somehow going to gain the rank is going to gain actually that might just help i mean i am being very mercenary here i don't have any other good answer and that is why i tried to give all this uh, discussion that it is not just for women that we are doing this i think and only thing i can keep on saying is i can only talk to People, uh, to some extent, people who are converted, people who are sitting in front of me, you know, I can see uh, uh, Professor Kulkarni or I can see a few other uh, men's name. So I can say that one has to somewhere convey this word to the, to the institution, that it is for the institution that we have to do this. Somewhere that has to go through. I think that's all I can say. And that perception, if we change, we can perhaps get meant to act on it. So let me oh, come to This is a very important message. So we'll certainly do our best to convey to the entire community. Yeah. At least I think, Kavita, for the next workshop, we should have lots of men also participating in the event. I'll make sure of that. <laughs> okay, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Kulkarni, one way would be to. Uh, have a role in uh, saying some few words from the their observation from the male side so that there is a complete program, maybe a way out. So actually, we're going to send a feedback form uh, soon, and you know I, we hope that all of you will receive not just attending, also the other people as well. So that is one way to getting your feedback and inputs. So that's what we will try to do. Okay, so um, I think uh, it's just a little bit ahead, behind schedule. So I will Dr. quickly just introduce. Yeah, I wanted so to say that uh, Gati. Can you? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say that Gati has to be owned by every community member. So. Uh, uh, the starting from the Gati self-assessment team, you know, very, very important that men should join as allies. They should be signatories to the Gati Charter. This can be a mission for every institution, but also as part of the advocacy group within the institution and beyond that, it is important now, see, because if you just look at the um, huge task in 18 months or right now only in 10 months as an institution you have of evidence-based data-driven self-assessment. So um, this is a non-linear complex process. It has to be treated like a scientific problem. You don't have to go linearly from, you know, criteria one to criteria seven. So uh, different criteria have to be uh, simultaneously investigated just as an exercise form constitute groups which are uh, obviously there are very few women so uh, the male colleagues have to take the lead in that and uh, 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 that i think will create the ownership so gati has to be owned by the community members and since male colleagues outnumber the female colleagues uh, so be it let them lead because this is for the institution and uh, this is one. And the second is that somewhere because each of the, uh, look at the large number of uh, uh, postgraduate and uh, research cohort, uh, obviously they're being mentored and supervised by male colleagues. So there has to be a sense of a very strong sense of uh, comradeship, a uh, sense of uh, how these young women have to be able to, uh, they have to be helped to craft successful science career. They are aspirational. So the mentors are in, incentivized in my opinion, Shubhna. It goes beyond just, you know, uh, maybe we will next time not call it as gender. Uh, based program. It is about seeing that uh, our clan has to 
survive and thrive. And a clan is our academic clan. So it is very, very important that we do this handholding, mentoring, uh, uh, and counseling, and ensuring that the talent group that is, as I said, knocking on the doors and looking for uh, placements and uh, carving successful career in um, uh, elite institutions where they can carry forward the kind of research they've done at the PhD level. It is our moral imperative for both male and female colleagues. So it is with this sense that uh, we will be judged also by how our own students perform later in life um, that we will be able to engage and incentivize. I don't like the word incentivize, but it is we take ownership and accountability. So as you create the action plans, the ownership, role assignment and accountability has to be uh, optimally distributed. It is not only for the women and it is for the sake of the younger generation who must carve uh, their um, careers in our kind of institution. So I think this is how I look at it. And uh, it's about ownership, not incentives. Yeah, thank you, Pratila. Okay, so uh, I think I just uh, want to, you know, now we'll just wind, try to wind up this program. And before doing that, I just wanted to introduce you to the team who the, who's working here. So I just share my screen. Is it shared? Yeah. I hope uh, am I shared here? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So uh, this is the as the Pratibha already said that we need to all the selected institutions have to have this GSAT, which is the Gati Self Assessment Team. So in JNC we have a core team which consists of Professor Kulkarni, who as you know is the president and the PI of the Gati project myself and Ms. Navonita Guha. She is the senior library uh, information officer and uh, she is the project coordinator for this uh, program. And Ms. Anjana, she is the project assistant who was hired for this program. So uh, uh, Anjana is the one so much work behind the scenes for this program. Uh, besides four of us, we also have Dr. Bani Khan Sharma. Uh, he is a faculty in the new chemistry unit. Mrs. Veena, she is a senior administration assistant in the stores and purchase section. Mr. Srinivasan, who is senior secretary to the president. And Ms. Rujna Datta, she is a PhD student in the molecular biology and genetics unit. So we have had some meetings and we'll be having more uh, regular meetings and uh, let's hope, uh, you know, we'll make some progress. Um, so, um, before I finish now, I, can I request all of you to turn on your videos so that we can have uh, take a snapshot? Can I request all of you, all the attendees? Can you please turn on your videos? Stop sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, fine. So I'll stop it. Uh, how do I stop it? I'd just like to add congratulations to DNC and it's excellent that you have a website and uh, you have your core uh, uh, team and uh, we'll soon maybe also have satellite task forces and uh, task groups so fantastic yeah. now the web page, web page is certainly a good beginning yeah so i forgot to mention uh, that you can is uh, essential so yeah so, so you can I access this website all the luck to the program if you go to jnc website and go to outreach you will uh, get all the information about the Gati events and about Gati. So, um, yeah. So, thank you all of you for joining us today and um, stay safe. And probably, as we'll see more of you next time. Thank you. So, do you see? I have, we still don't have all the people like uh, things uh, turned down. Yeah. So, Namunita, can you turn on your videos, please? Parul, Roja, Srishti. Ah, okay. Yeah. Can we have a snap, please? <laughs> okay. 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 So thank you very much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Professor Kavita. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.